In today's episode, I'm going to look at some potential next steps in order to improve the RSI and stochastic RSI strategies we've been looking at if you want to take that further yourself. What's more, I'm going to look at some position size analysis and look at how the position sizing strategy affects the return over drawdown ratio. I'll be right back after this brief message. DarwinX is a UK FCA regulated broker and asset manager on a mission to disrupt the financial trading, investing and asset management industries. If you're a talented trader looking to attract investor capital to your strategies, DarwinX is the fastest way for you to do this. We enable traders to raise third party investor capital and then charge success fees on high watermark profits. Additionally, DarwinX itself invests in its traders with our seed capital allocation program that allocates up to 90 million euros per year in successful trading strategies. So if all of that sounds interesting, learn more by clicking on the link here or you can find further links in the description right below. Now back to today's tutorial. Welcome back. This is episode 36 in the Spotlight on Indicators trading series. And if you're joining us for the first time, you can find a link to the entire series in the video description. So this is where we got to last time. The orange equity curve here represents the simple RSI strategy that we implemented. And the blue curve is the stochastic RSI. Now, we use different time frames for each of these because of the frequency of which they traded. The stochastic RSI produced many more trades than RSI, and so by running RSI on a lower time frame meant that we had a more comparable set of results. I'm going to start off today by looking at the effects of position sizing on these strategies, and I'm going to focus my attention on the stochastic RSI. So if you remember, this equity curve was achieved using minimum lot sizes only. So every single position that was opened on any of the 28 currency pairs was just 0.01. Now, normally for a production trading strategy, I'd be looking at some form of equivalent risk position sizing. So this is where you would take your stop loss, so your maximum deviation from your open price, and then adjust the position sizing so that it had the same impact in percentage terms on your equity, regardless of the position and regardless of the equity in the account. However, in order to use this, we would need a stop loss implemented. And of course, that's something that you would need to do if you were going to trade this in a production environment. But it's something we haven't yet done on our development. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about next steps later on in this episode. But for now, I'm going to use what I call relative lot sizes. And so this is just going to simply scale the lot size of each position based on what the current equity is at the time that the position opens. So this isn't ideal, but it will just give us an idea of how the strategy reacts to an increasing position size and a position size that gets scaled as equity in the account grows. So I'm going to start out fairly conservatively here and I'm going to say that I want to use minimum lots per 5,000 of equity in the account at the time that the position opens. So I've been using a starting equity of 10,000 and previously I was using lot sizes of 0.01. But now, with this new position sizing model, when the equity is 10,000, it will use minimum lots per 5,000, and so it will start off with a position size of 0.02, so twice what we had before. However, the main difference here is that as the equity begins to grow, the position size will also be scaled up. So let's now start that off and take a look at the effect. OK, and we'll come back to this in a moment when it's finished. OK, so that has now finished 
and in a moment I'll look at how this compares to the equity curve that we got using just minimum lots. But before I do that, I just want to look at some of the metrics for this original curve using minimum lots. So the return here over the five year period was just over 30% with a maximum drawdown of 5.37%. So there's nothing earth shattering about those results. But remember, we are just using minimum lots. Now, a metric that is ideal for comparing equity curves is the return over drawdown. And by simply taking 30.4, dividing that by 5.37, we get a metric value of 5.7. And so it's this primarily that we'll be comparing as we adjust the position size. So let's now overlay this new equity curve that's using minimum lots per 5,000 of equity. And this is what it looks like. So we've obviously had to rescale the axes here, which is why the blue curve now looks much shallower. And if we take a look at the metrics for this, we can see that by just doubling that initially, it's the effect of compounding as the equity grows that means the return is now more than three times what it was previously. However, so is the percentage drawdown. And so now we've exceeded 15% drawdown. And I think that that drawdown is occurring here from this high down to this low here. And obviously something is occurring in the markets here that's causing this huge fall in the equity curve and for it then to almost recover. But this is something that's worthy of investigation because whenever you see anything like this, you need to understand how a strategy that you're trading will react to different things that happen in the markets. And it's quite possible that the introduction of a stop loss would reduce the intensity of this drawdown. But further analysis would be required to know that. But if we now take a look at the return over drawdown metric here, we can see that this has gone up to 6.5. And what that means is that the increase in the position sizing here has had a bigger impact on the return than it has on the drawdown. If both of those values had grown linearly, then the return over drawdown metric would have remained the same. But obviously, the return is increasing to a greater percentage extent than the drawdown is, and that will be due to this compounding effect. Now, 15% drawdown is realistically the most that the majority of traders would be able to tolerate. And many traders think they could tolerate more than this. But when it comes to it and you're in this kind of drawdown, that's often a different matter. So certainly I wouldn't recommend that this strategy in its current form should use a position sizing strategy anything more aggressive than this. Certainly not until some of the larger drawdowns have been removed with the introduction, for example, of a stop loss. But as a purely academic exercise, let's see what happens if we do increase this further. And so next, instead of using minimum lots per 5,000 in the account, I'm going to look at minimum lots per two and a half thousand. And so at the beginning of the equity curve here, when the equity is 10,000, that means that that initial position size will be 0 0.04. And again, as we overlay the equity curve here, we'll have to rescale those axes and we now get this yellow curve. And as you can see, the return has now grown substantially and it's over two and a half times bigger than the previous return. However, the maximum drawdown has also increased to 25%. But because the return has increased to a greater extent, the return over drawdown metric has increased and that is now at 9.7. But if we look at the maximum drawdown here now, this is becoming really scary. And just to reiterate, you should not be increasing position size, in my view, that will produce this kind of drawdown. 
and then one more final chart just to look at the effect of this on that return over drawdown metric and this is where we're using minimum lots per thousand in the account and as you can see here you're going to lose over half of your equity when you hit that maximum drawdown. Now, another point to make here is that generally speaking, drawdowns that you experience in your production account will usually be larger than you've experienced in backtesting. Even though we do our best to avoid over-optimization in any backtest, it's inevitable that some degree of overfitting will occur and because of that you'll often find that your drawdown in the real account is worse. So that's something to always have at the back of your mind whenever you are deciding on your position sizing strategy. So let's now move on and look at some of the potential next steps that you would need to take in order to improve this strategy and make it production ready. And the first we've already covered, this is the implementation of a stop loss or some alternative risk management technique. So you have to have some way of managing your risk. And I'm fully aware that stop losses are not the only way of doing that. They're probably the most common way. But the point is that you need to manage your risk. And at the moment, in this strategy, we are purely trading based on open and close signals based on the rules that we implemented. There is no risk management in there at the moment. So if you were wanting to take this on to a production system, this is an absolute must do. You might also want to look at the potential that implementing a take profit has on the system. So this is deciding where your exit will be at the time that you open your position. And this, of course, is one way that traders often manage their return over risk ratio for an individual position. So, for example, you could set your take profit twice as far away from your entry point as your stop loss. And then if that trade is profitable, you'll make twice as much as you lose if you hit your stop loss. But you also have to bear in mind that the further your take profit is away from the entry and the closer your stop loss is to the entry will dramatically change the hit rate of your trading. So it will become much more likely that your stop loss will hit. And so that's something that has to be taken into account also, not just the distance from the entry. The next thing before trading any strategy is to explore any anomalies that appear in the backtesting stage. And I already alluded to one of these earlier, and it was this point here in the equity curve. But there's also another one right here. And it's in the opposite direction, and it's in favour of the equity curve. However, if you'd happen to be holding positions in the opposite direction, then that could have had a dramatic negative effect on the equity. And so whenever you see something like this, you have to drill down, look at the trades that caused the anomaly, then look at what happened in the market at that time before considering what you can do to help avoid that happening. Now, as I said before, the implementation of a stop loss may well remove these anomalies from the equity curve, and that would have to be something that you tested. So returning back, the next thing is the implementation of regime filters. And by this, I'm talking about things like trend or ranging type indicators to give you an idea of what the market is doing at the time you're going to open your trade. Now, the RSI and stochastic RSI strategies that we've been looking at are based on a mean reverting premise. And so very often, these will work best in a ranging market rather than in a strongly trending market. Other regime filters will look at volatility and you can perform analysis to see how well your strategy performs in high volatile environments, low volatile and medium. And likewise for market noise. 
and I've produced numerous videos on all of these regime filters in the past, so be sure to look those up if you need more information on them. The next consideration is symbol filtering. Different assets will behave in different ways and have different market dynamics. Some assets will be well suited to a particular type of strategy, but not to others. Now, in the work that I've done here, I haven't paid any attention to this and I've just used 28 currency pairs in all of the backtesting. And I know from experience by only trading assets that are matched to this style of strategy would improve the results substantially. And again, I've produced many videos in the past that cover this subject in a lot of detail. And last but certainly not least is the implementation of your own ideas. If you're anything like me, your brain will be continually on overdrive thinking about new potential ideas for strategies, for filters, and so on. And coming up with these, of course, is what will differentiate you from other traders. So that brings us to the end of this episode. And in the next three episodes, as I've said before, these are going to focus on coding tutorials and they're going to look at functionality that I've used in this series. I'll be using MQL5 for these, but the logic here can be converted to any programming language of your choice. If you think you have any relevant information, hints or tips about the topic of any of my videos, then please remember to comment so that I and other viewers can all benefit from your insights. Also, if you're getting value from this video, then please remember to give me a thumbs up. Now, until next time, trade safe.